Well, people are eating there, they're sleeping there. I'm just curious about the conditions in this. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you, because next, the next step is I get introduced. Because I backflashed him one too many times, I get introduced to S.P. Hall. And Dave announces to all the 40 staff members who are over there, I realize now this is my S.P. pointing at me. This is the suppressive person who's, who's destroying my case and making my life so miserable. Me right? you. Okay. Yeah, and there's 30 of the 40 of them are looking at me through glassy eyes because, you know, yesterday it was one of them and the day before it was another one of them. And you know what I'm saying? Like every day he's announcing the new find of who the real suppressive is. So now I'm the real suppressive. So he says, so Miscavige tells them, all right, this guy's been suppressing me covertly for 20 years, you know. And so there's one new rule in this place. And the new rule is this. If anybody listens to a single word that Marty says, you're getting instantly declared suppressive person, expelled, excommunicated from the church. In other words, he wanted to make them know I'm the bottom of the bottom, right? And like I said, I mean, half of them are looking at me with these glassy eyes like, they've, they've had the same introduction, each one of them's had the same introduction. You know, it, it grows old after a while. In any event, Tom, what happens is this. He leaves the room. Miscavige leave, and his entourage leaves the room. The first, Tom DeVock is in charge of the group. He's the in charge. He's been appointed like three days earlier by Dave. And Tom was at one time at, at Clearwater headquarters in Flag. Or, right. Right, right. But Tom DeVock is the in charge of the room. So when Dave leaves, he's the guy who has to keep everybody all organized, and they got to go try to stay focused. On what? I don't know. They're supposed to be working on the org board, all these things that Dave will never approve. So Tom DeVock hears that whole thing, right? The first thing he does when Dave leaves the room is come over to me and he says, Marty, what are we going to do? <laughs> he asked me. The thing, he was supposed to be declared suppressive and he did. I went, Tom, I don't know. Listen, I guess all you can do is try to fly below the radar and try to figure out what the answers are are to the questions that he wants to hear. Like, you know, don't try to figure out what the real answers are. Just try to keep feeding him what he wants to hear. And he kind of laughed or whatever, but... Mm -hmm. That Tom was such a direct person like that, you know, that was why I was so fond of the guy. You know, he was always a very direct person, but you know, and he wouldn't he wouldn't get programmed by this stuff. Like Miss Gavage says, first guy says anything, he's going to get declared. First thing Tom does is violate it. <laughs> Come and see me. So, and that's why the next events that folded out that led to me leaving were so significant to me because I had a great deal of uh, respect and, uh, and uh, affinity for Tom. So you, you're in this place called SP Hall. Right. The double wides. And you're in there for a few days and uh, someone, Mr. Miscavige, suggests a game couple of days okay and uh, it's all has it's all part of this theme of offloading so it was constantly telling everybody we're gonna I'm gonna offload you that's a big threat he has mm -hmm. I'm gonna offload you from the C organization you're gonna get dumped at a bus station in Vegas and go fend for yourself and you're declared and you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. so one night he says all right we're gonna uh, okay because one of the games he played I told you, he said, he said Ms. Gavage used to say you guys got to handle the postings you got to handle the org board you got to handle the finance system I forgot one of the other ones the other one was you got to handle the offloads and there's always this thing about determine who's going to get offloaded it's like the Stalin purges you know what I'm saying get all the people that are have intention counters to mine out of here right so that was another figure figure thing so now, since nobody will come up to him with a list of who needs to be offloaded to make everything peaches and cream up there, he says, I've decided how we're going to get the offloads done. So he comes in and he makes everybody arrange the chairs around the big conference table and flip them backwards so the chairs are facing out. And he says, you all remember uh, musical chairs from your childhood. And then he goes through a description of how, to, how you play musical chairs. And he counted them all up, made sure there was one less chair than there were people. And he says, when the music starts, you go around the chairs, and when it stops, you get in the chair. And whoever doesn't get in the chair, you're offloaded. But it's just going to keep going until there's only one left. Okay? Listen, guys like Tom and myself are looking at this, like rolling our eyes, like, you know, here he is into his psychosis. But a lot of people were taking this seriously. 
I mean, one guy, I remember, so he started the thing, and not only, there was this whole twisted thing about it, too, because he played this song, Bohemian Rhapsody. The one by Queen? By Queen, yeah, and, he, mm-hmm. and, he, uh, and there was all this significance attached to it, because it, he was saying, you guys, nobody cares, because, you know, this, you, you've all committed these heinous crimes against humanity, and now you're in the same position as this guy in the song, that nothing matters anymore, right? So this song got played over and over all night long as he played this sadistic game of musical chairs. Tom, I'm telling you, you know, some people that are hardened vets, like myself and Tom DeVock and probably Mike Rinder, some of the others, you know, you're taking those with a grain of salt because you've seen a lot of surreal stuff with this guy. But some people that weren't so hardened or so inured to that kind of conduct and so exposed to it, this was extremely... uh, emotionally trying for these people. I remember one kid was was literally crying uh, because he got eliminated and and, and, and then Miscavige started having his his uh, secretaries run up to the office because he had his reservations computer, um, computer to print off tickets. Like he said, you're going to offload you to the Edmonton org. You know, it gets to 22 degrees below zero out there in the wintertime. And, uh, and so anyway, he, one of those kids got a ticket and he's, the guy was weeping. He says, what are you weeping about? He says, my wife. Because he'd said, you're going to leave your wives behind. You're going to leave your family behind. You're just going to go off. You know what I mean? He's literally going to, he's literally going to separate families for good. And so the guy's weeping. So what, you know what Miscavige says to him? Tough. I don't see anybody weeping for me. So he's, he's playing this song, and he tells someone to stop it, start and stop it. Right. right? And uh, what is happening between these adults as they circle and try to find a, a chair when the music stops? Oh, they're scrambling and hammering. I had a bad back. I have a bad lower back, and it got knocked out because a guy who was pretty chunky hit me. <laughs> so I was going for just I was eliminated pretty early. Plus, I didn't really care because I know everything. These threats just, you know, you know what I'm saying? You get to a point where it's like... And did the game... It's an but, overload. But mm-hmm. it got really vicious. Because I watched most of it, because I got I got eliminated early. I mean, there was guys getting in fights for the chairs. I mean, one chair, one chair, they literally it was like an office swivel chair, and two guys were going. No, it was a uh, no, it was one. It was one of the uh, hard backed, uh, like an auditorium movable chair, and they t- literally tore that whole chair apart. These two big guys got in a fight over the chair, and they. One took the top off, one took the thing off, and they're bending all the metal, just destroyed the entire chair. But there was people, you know, ramming people in, like, you know, cross body blocks into the walls and, you know, ripping people's clothing off. And, you know, it was was really, uh, really pretty sickening. How long did it last? Uh, Hours. It's like it started, I mean, I couldn't give you exact times because you lose a sense of time in a scene like that, but it was like, I think it started like midnight and went to 4 a.m. or something like that, probably three, four hours. Mm-hmm. Okay. And at the end, I presume there was a winner? Somebody st- still standing with her, had, had a chair? Yeah. Okay. And that but it was all meaningless to me at that point. I mean, like I told you, I got out early and, you know what I'm saying? Okay. But interestingly, interestingly, now that you bring that up, as I recall, it was a woman who was who was a Kool-Aid drinker, who who if this guy ever does go the full Jim Jones route, would probably be right behind him. I mean, so you get the idea of who was serious about it. Okay. Now, okay, so it's it's uh, he leaves at one point. Well, how does he say goodbye for the night? I have no idea. Okay. I'm just blanking it out. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just you know, I, yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny. You're in a surreal scene like that. And you decide not to participate, and it just, you know, it's like literally I recall looking out the window. Mm-hmm. Looking out the window at the, at, the, at the grounds and trying to see some car lights pass on the, you know, just to distract myself. It's, you know what I'm saying? I don't know how, I, I don't know how he left, but, but I do know, I do have this general concept that it was get your bags packed because it's really going to happen type of thing. And then it was, and so people were, they were left in the limbo of thinking the next morning they were going to Timbuktu or getting offloaded entirely or, you know what I'm saying, they getting shipped halfway out of the country mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. And then the next day it was like, 
I don't remember how it came up, but it was like, oh, we're not going to do that now. We're going to do something else. 